It's rainy out. It's gloomy. It's cool, but it's rainy. Overcast. It's going to be raining all day. And for some of you, my dear brethren and sisters, and even myself at times, a gloomy day is also how we often feel, isn't it? That uh, the, the rain will never end, right? A day of darkness and gloominess and sorrow. Whether you are dealing with depression, living amongst the family that is Catholic, whether your own family seems to be turned against you, whether you are employed due to your employment and you are vexed daily by the conversation of the wicked. Or because of a past mistake that you are long forgiven of. You just can't seem to get a break, can you? Or the Lord who is using you as a testimony on one who is departing. And you are made to see one whom you love very much who um, brought you into this world. You get to see them decline and inevitably waste away and fade away. Whatever your plight is, you can't pay your bills, whatever it is. We have the church of the living God. We're going through a lot of stuff. Whatever it is, whatever whatever your plight is, we're all going through something. Someone I will I will go as far as to say that someone is a heretic, not saved. If every day of their life everything is hunky dory, that there's no that there's no chastening involved in their life, or they're not suffering for the true cause. And what cause is that? To be a witness unto the lost of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> you're not suffering today. If you're not feeling the angst that comes from the lost world. You live in a fantasy land. You live in a fantasy land where your God is nothing but a genie in a bottle. You rub, it, you rub him the right way, and out he comes. Now, that's not realistic. That's not facing the real world. And the real world is dark. The real world is sad. But what does our Lord Jesus Christ say? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And see, Christians make that trivial because they shoot that out as a, as a catchphrase. Just like, uh, I can do all things through Christ whom strengtheneth me, which is scriptural truth. But see, the Christians, in order to glorify themselves, they throw out uh, words of the scriptures um, just to justify themselves. And then here you and I are. Here you and I are. your authorized version of the scriptures. And turn with me to the book of Psalms. Follow me along. Word for word. Verse by verse at the scriptures we are going to be looking at today. Follow me along. Check me out. Keep me accountable. Check me out. Please, follow me along in the scriptures. If you have to, pause the video. Read the context in its entirety if you have to. Do whatever you got to do. Follow me along in the scriptures. Okay? Psalm 43. Have you ever been here, brother, sister? 
judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Isn't it something that it seems today that the unjust and the deceitful man are rising up higher and higher while we, the church of the living God, getting lower and lower? He must increase, but we must decrease. Yes, yes. But see, it's the sign of the times. It's a sign of the times. People don't want to hear the truth. They want to have their ears itched and tickled, stuff like that. They want to hear smooth things. They want to have people prophesy to them deceits. Verse 2. What separates us from them? What separates us from those who profess and wear a facade? For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me in unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Look at verse 2. For thou art the God of my strength. You are my strength, O Lord. Why dost thou cast me off? And if you are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, you are part of his bones and of his flesh. And we're going to look at that verse today. But something to consider for some of us. Are you doing that which he pleases not in? Are you seeking on to lying vanities? Are you going to the devil for comfort? If you are... If you are, he might be handing you over to those things. But if you're not, if you're not, you ever been here? <laughs> Lord, why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Why, why do I got to see this? Why? Oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me onto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. Oh, wait, oh, wait a minute. Yes. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Look at that verse right there. Hope in God. What are you hoping in? What are you hoping in? Who are you hoping in? I talk to a lot of people who, who believe and know that there is going to be a redemption of the purchased possession. But what I find nowadays is so often, so many people want to extract the Lord from that redemption of the purchased possession and looking merely just for the event itself, not the one on of whom the event actually is. Does that make sense? I've encountered many, actually, who are looking for the redemption of the purchased possession. But what is the redemption of the purchased possession? Jesus Christ. Who is it? Jesus Christ. I am the resurrection, he said. So the blessed hope, the redemption of the purchased possession, while, in a, while in an event in itself, yes. But what is the base, the, the root of that event? Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ. You can't abstract away the Lord Jesus Christ from the redemption of the purchased possession dear brethren and looking more merely just for an event and yeah it's going to be an event absolutely yes but remember the Lord Jesus Christ himself he is 
our blessed hope. He is the redemption of the purchased possession. He is our redeemer, is he not? Because what happens? What happens? You want to get out of here now? A second ago, yesterday. So do I. But it didn't happen yesterday. Did it? No. Didn't happen 10 seconds ago, did it? No. And what can happen is, well, you know what the scriptures say. You know that there's going to be a redemption of the purchased possession. You know it here. But what happens is, over time, your hopes being cut to pieces that the event didn't happen. And hence, that's why some people out there who are firm, staunch, uh, supporters of the redemption of the purchased possession. This is why some people nowadays, like, they, they've gone, and the terminology they use, they've gone post-trip. He, he sounds like uh, he's no longer in favor of the redemption of the purchased possession. Well, I'll agree to, uh, to an extent that such an individual, whomever they may be, um, does sound a little hardened, yes, 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 but that doesn't always necessarily mean that they have, you know, well, it hasn't happened in so long and I've been looking for it all my life. I'm just, No, that's not generally what that means. What it means is sometimes people abstract, uh, extract the Lord from the event and not remembering that the Lord is that event. And when you are aware, when you remember, what is the blessed hope? What is the blessed hope? Our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Yes, we are going to be caught up. Yes, we are. And we're going to look at that today. We are going to be caught up. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. It didn't happen yet, unfortunately. But there's a reason why it didn't happen yet. I tell you this all the time. Who got saved yesterday? Who wasn't part of the Church of the Living God yesterday? Who had a testimony given against them by your example of living your life according to the Scriptures? It's not about you. It's not about you. I'm smacking myself because I need to remember that too. It's not about you. It's not about you. But we have hope. And what is our hope? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Psalm 46. Go to Psalm 46. Remember. There is going to be a redemption of the purchased possession. Okay? Liars, devils, heretics who save themselves, whether it's those of Mark the Messenger or whatever they are, these work salvationists that got to do, you know, who speak words to no profit, trying to bring people back under the law. But what is our hope? Our hope is Jesus Christ himself. And those people who are against the redemption of the purchased possession and are what is called post-tribulation, there is a place and grace for ignorance, those who do not know better. Okay? But when one becomes aware of the truth that there is a redemption of the purchased possession and choose to dis, uh, to disregard that truth you're you're lost you're lost you are you know the truth of the redemption of the purchased possession you know what the scriptures say but you reject that and say oh no we're going through the time of Jacob's trouble 
You're lost. What is our hope? Psalm 46. And try to remember this. While you're seeing what you are seeing, whatever it is you're seeing, when your family has turned against you, where by not your choice, but of necessity, what you are surrounded by pummels you daily with vexation. Remember this. Remember the sight of your eyes and the hearing of your ears, what you are hearing and seeing in the, your beloved who brought you into this world. Remember this. Remember this. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Have you forgotten that? Where is he in my... Where was he when I was in trouble? Number one, did you go to him? Yeah, I did. Okay, did you sincerely go to him? Or did you just go to him, Lord, help me, and then that was it? Lord, help me, and that was it? And then go about trying to figure out your problems on your own power? And not wait on him? Yeah, I know. We, we're not doctors. We don't have patients, right? Ooh. Ooh. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear. Now, this is not talking about not having the fear of the Lord. This is talking about fearing the things of the world. Okay? Though the earth be removed, you know the ground that you're walking on that you think is so firm and it seems that sometimes the rug gets <laughs> yanked out from under you? And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Shilah, there is a river streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. Now, remember, we are reading the Psalms doctrinally uh, under the law. Doctrinally, not all the Psalms pertain unto us for doctrine. There are things within the Psalms that cross dispensational lines. You've got to remember that. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. We are looking at this for instruction, learning how to do something in righteousness, whose righteousness is. you got to remember, doctrine pertains on what makes man right with God within the dispensation. What is pertaining unto salvation within that dispensation? That is what the root core of doctrine is. Okay, instruction in righteousness, which the Old Testament is abundant in, is for us to learn how we ought to live within the dispensation. Okay, how we ought to live. There is a difference between instruction and in righteousness and doctrine. Doctrine is pertaining on how to one is made right with God. Instruction and in righteousness is living instructions. Ways to fear the Lord. Ways how we ought to walk. We get that today within the Pauline epistles. Yes, but remember what Paul said. All things were written that were written aforetime were written for our learning. So we can learn from the example given to us in the Old Testament. You, you cast away the Old Testament, man. You, you're, you're crippled. You are crippled. Okay? You really are. You really are. But see, there again, you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. Or you become like Mark the Messenger. Okay? And it behooves me. So many of the people who are still commenting on that video, it's, it's like, dude, you, you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. The people who are going to defend that heretic 
are all going to the same place. The Sermon on the Mount. Got to rightly divide the word of truth, dear friend. But, excuse me, that rabbit trail. Let's continue, okay? I, I brought that up because of verse 5. God is in the midst of her. Israel. Israel. Remember, the woman with the crown of 12 stars is not the Roman Catholic Mary. God forbid. No, it's Israel. Okay? God is in the midst of her. Who is the her? Israel. Okay? She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Shelah. See her. The God of Jacob. Her. Israel. Okay? Israel. Israel is compared unto a woman. Yes. Yes. Israel. Jacob. Yes. Israel. But the beauty that Israel is to become is likened unto a beautiful woman. Okay? Remember. The woman in Revelation 12 with the crown and the 12 stars is not the Roman Catholic Mary. It's not the church of the living God. It's Israel. Okay? Well, let's continue. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder, he burneth the chariot of fi in the fire. Now note the switch here. Note the change in direction here within the psalm. Every, Virtually every psalm has this, okay? You see about his uh, promises onto Israel. About no matter, you know, the mountains be moved. What does it say? Verse 5. God is in the midst of her. Is God in the midst of Israel physically right now today? No, he is not. Okay, But verse 8, Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. What is this talking about? When he come back at his second coming. How do you know that? Verse 7, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The God of Jacob today is not the refuge of Israel. He is, yes, he is. But are they going to the Lord today? No, they are not. No, they are not. That's the purpose of the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Israel as a nation is not looking onto the God of their fathers, to the God of Jacob. They are not looking onto the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not. Okay? They will, but not yet. Hence, at his second coming, he maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. And brethren, for you and I today, be still and know that I am God. That doesn't mean that you are to sit there and be complacent and do nothing. That's not what that means. It's not what it means at all. Be still here. Know that God is in control. No, no, hold your place because we're gonna we're not yet finished. No, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, saved, born again, converted, of the church of the living God, according to his purpose. Verse 28. Romans 8, 28. Job 28, 28. And unto man he said, The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, the called, saved. Saved. Not the Calvinistic elect and non-elect. Nothing like that. No. You go to the Lord on His terms, the way of the cross, and we're going to have a video talking about the cross here sometime this week, Lord willing. But you go on His terms, He has called you the way of the cross. What does the cross signify? Death. Death 
to yourself. Okay? More on that in another video. Okay, go back to now to Psalm 46. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And today, us Gentiles have been grafted into the tree of the Jew. I'm not Jewish, but I'm grafted into the tree of the Jew. Hence, hence, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Salah. Because of the adoption of us Gentiles being grafted into the tree of the Jew, remember, it is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Okay? But being grafted in, hence, the promises that belong to Israel belong unto us today as well. Okay? We are grafted in. That's why this dispensation is unlike any that will be until, of course, eternity, the seventh and final dispensation, where there is no sin, of course, then that's going to be wow, wow, wow. No sin at all. Can you imagine? That's why we want, that's why we so earnestly, earnestly seek and want. <laughs> Come on, Lord. It hasn't happened yet. And most of us who are truly saved are going through a lot of troubles and sufferings. And with the suffering of those who are saved, born again, converted, who are declared righteous in the eyes of the Lord, covered in the blood of the crucified one, okay? You can understand the book of Job. Job, you gotta remember, Job had the best testimony of all. God himself twice said of Job that he was a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth, departeth, escheweth evil. Twice God said that of Job himself personally. You ain't gonna get a better uh, recommendation or reference than that. When the Lord says that of you himself, you ain't going to get better than that. But Satan was allowed to tempt Job, to afflict him. But yet Job was righteous. Job messed up towards the latter end of the book of Job, and he started lifting up himself. Okay? He was egged on. Yes, he was. He was egged on. But remember, he wasn't forced at gunpoint to fall into their egging on and lift up himself. you got to remember that. Okay? The longer you walk with the Lord and the more, the more you see of the, the misery of the lost, the wickedness of the devil, and all the infiltration and the um, perversion that happens, and the confusion, the confusion that Satan has sown, You can lose hope really quick sometimes. Job chapter 9. Now we're going to have some expository here throughout this video. Bits and pieces there. Nothing too deep. Okay? We're going to read Job 9 verses 20 on to the close of the chapter. Follow me along, please. Job 9, beginning at verse 20 on to verse 21. Then we're going to have a look at some verses. If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also perv prove me perverse. Ah. And unfortunately, verse 20, that is exactly what Job started to do. That is exactly what Job started to do. You know where it says that the words of Job are ended? That whole spiel that he went into before the young whippersnapper, Elihu, oh, uh, opened up his mouth. Job did exactly this. He did. Verse 21. Though I were perfect, yet I would not know my soul. 
I would despise my life. See, those of you who think you are good people, those of you who think you are good people, you don't know your own soul. <laughs> you don't know your own heart. You don't know yourself. You can deceive yourself by, you know, doing the commandments and keeping them. And then, uh, like with Catholics, well, I was confirmed. I was baptized. I ate a cookie today. Those are all works. Those are what justify you? Hmm? The works of the law? Or is it the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ? Is it the Lord himself who justifies you? By his grace, through your faith. If I justify myself mine own mouth, it shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet I would not know my soul. I would despise my life. And I run into so many of these people. Oh, oh, I'm not, I know I'm not perfect. I know, I know. You're a sinner who's going to hell. Who, you deserve to go to hell. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. <laughs> that also happens with a lot of Christians. A lot of Christians. Oh yeah, I, I'm a, we're all sinners. Yeah, you know, but don't you, you realize that you're just absolutely no good uh, at all? There's not no no good redeeming quality within you. I'm not that bad. <laughs> Apparently not. Uh, hold your place and go to Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. I'm going to do a little backtracking here. Proverbs 27. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth. A stranger, not thine own lips. If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. And, and while we're at it, uh, go to Psalm, uh, Proverbs 25, just one verse. Verse 27. It is not good to eat much honey. So for men to search their own glory. It's not glory. If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, I shall also prove me. It, it shall also prove me perverse. Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul. I would despise my life. Pro Proverbs twenty verse six. Proverbs twenty verse six. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. A faithful man who can find. And we have been called. To be just that, faithful. Who are you faithful to? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him? You know, the Christians with their little sick CCM uh, song, you know, I can praise him through the storm or something. Can you? It's a gloomy day. Can you praise the Lord on a gloomy day? Can you praise the Lord that you have no idea how you're going to pay your bills? Can you praise the Lord that you're, you know, Lord, why am I seeing this? You have a purpose, whatever it is, I don't know. Thank you. Go back to Job. Verse 22. This is one thing. Therefore I said it. Therefore I said it. He destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. He destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. We're all going to die. One event happeneth to them all. To the good, to the clean, and to the unclean. We're all going to die. You're not going to escape that. But go to Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57. The righteous perish. Uh, Isaiah 57, verses 1 under verse 12. The righteous perisheth, no man layeth it to heart. 
The merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Ye shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Now, whether we be redeemed by the redemption of the purchased possession, whether we die, to be absent from the body is to be present for the Lord. See, you and I, whether we be redeemed or die, we're going to be with the Lord. He shall enter into peace. You know that, that saying, only the good die young, and the evil, like the guy from Blackpool, live forever? Doesn't it seem that way? It's true. Good people, the, only the good die young. But evil seems to live forever, doesn't it? Yeah. Verse 3. Let's continue now. But draw near hither, ye sons of the sorceress. Mystery of Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Yeah. The seed of the adulterer and the whore. Against whom do ye sport yourselves? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are ye not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood? Well, they justify themselves, don't they? Yeah. Inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree. <laughs> you thinking it. We're not going to say it. Okay? Slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. Among the smooth stones of the stream is thy portion. They are thy, thy lot. Even to them hast thou poured a drink offering. Thou hast offered a meat offering. Should I receive comfort in these? Yeah. Upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed. Even thither wentest thou up to offer sacrifice. Behind the doors also and the posts hast thou set up thy remembrance. For thou hast discovered thyself to another than me, and art gone up. Thou hast enlarged thy bed, and made thee a covenant with them. Thou lovest their bed, where thou sawest it. Don't go to the devil for comfort. Don't go to the devil for comfort. Don't go to the devil for truth. And thou wentest to the king with ointment, and didst increase thy perfumes, and didst send thy messengers far off, and didst debase thyself even unto hell. Hiding what was there with what? Ointment and perfume to cover up the stink. Okay? Ointment, you know, putting the oil on your head. You can liken that maybe also to putting on uh, war paint, face makeup, okay? Trying to cover what is actually there to make it look better. And in doing that, what do you do? And didst debase thyself even unto hell. Thou art wearied in the greatness of thy way. Yet saidest thou not, there is no hope. Thou hast found the life of thine hand. Therefore thou wast not grieved. And what does our Lord say? He who finds his life shall lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake, the same shall find it. See, you go to the world for comfort, and then you get that comfort from the world, uh, from Satan. Hey, I got hope. Hey, I got good clothes. I got money in the bank. Got a house or a uh, roof over my head. Luke chapter 12. You know, I'm gonna build. I'm gonna tear down the barns and build bigger, cause I got all this stuff. I got not enough room for the blessings that I got from the world. And what does our Lord say, thou fool? Today your soul will be required of thee. And all that stuff. Who's it gonna be? Who's it gonna go to? Are you gonna take it with you? I don't think so. And of whom hast thou been afraid or feared that thou hast lied and hast not? Remember me, or laid it to thy heart. Have I not held my peace even of old, and thou fearest me not? I will declare thy righteousness in thy works, for they shall not profit thee. 
You go into the devil for comfort. Hmm? You're seeking to put yourself under the law so you can exalt yourself. I will declare thy righteousness. Thy righteousness. Look, look, look at this verse. Look at this verse and compare it with verse 2. Okay? Take your finger here and your other finger here and look at these two verses. And my set of scriptures, they're virtually side by side. Look at verse 2. For the righteous, those who die in Christ, for our instruction in righteousness. This is, of course, Isaiah 57, instruction in righteousness. But look at this. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds each one walking in his uprightness. Okay? And look at verse 12. I will declare thy righteousness. Thy righteousness. And thy works. For they shall not profit thee. Look at those two verses. Look at those two verses. Okay? Verse 1 again. The righteous perisheth. No man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. Go back to Job 9. This is one thing, therefore I said it. He destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. They're all going to die. And destroyeth the perfect. Why would he do that? or take them away from the evil that's going to come? Spare us from the wickedness, that's the true wickedness that's going to come upon this world? Let's continue. Let's continue. And I'm checking my notes. Beg your pardon. Okay. If the scourge slay suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? Check this out. Check this out. Go to Habakkuk. Look at that verse. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. Why is that? Go to Habakkuk. Or as my wife used to say, Habakkuk. <laughs> but Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Come on, fingers, work with me. Habakkuk. Obadiah. Jonah. Micah. Habakkuk. There we go. Habakkuk. Chapter 1. Verses 1 and verse 4. Brother? Sister? Look at, look at verse... Oh, I just took my marker out of there. Look at verse 24 in Job chapter 9 again. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? The earth is given into the hands of the wicked. Habakkuk 1, verses 1 under verse 4. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Brother, sister, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou shew me iniquity and cause me to behold violent, uh, behold grievance, grievance, for spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise up strife and contention. Oh yeah, Christians are really good for that one, by the way. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Is that not the case today? Do you not feel that way today, dear brother, dear sister? What does our Lord say? Look, look across here in Habakkuk chapter 1 to verses 12 on to verse 13. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. And hast, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for corruption. Now, hold your place. I know we got to read verse 13 again. But hold your place and go back to Job 9, 24. 
The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. If not, where and who is he? If not, where and who is he? Why is the... Who is the little G God of this world? It's Satan. Why is Satan being allowed to do what he is doing? Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. And, O mighty God, thou hast established them for, correct, for correction. For judgment. For correction. God, okay, God wants all men everywhere to repent. Hey, Mr. Calvin, there's your heretical doctrine blown right out of the water. Not everybody's going to be saved, though, because too many people boot the door out of the way and shout through the crack their own heresy or their own, or their own doctrines, okay? There's one way, the way of the cross, which our Lord ordained. You go that way. That's the way he wants all men to come to. And not everybody's going to come that way. We know this. Let's see. What's going on today is judgment, okay? And... Not in its full extent. Why? Because the body of Christ is still here. We are still on the earth. Once we get taken out of the way, like it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Once we, the church of the living God, get redeemed, oh boy. Oh boy. These fools, man. Eh? These fools. Who think they gotta live it today? Who 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 say for today you gotta go, you gotta keep the Ten Commandments? You couldn't do that at gunpoint. You, you couldn't do that if someone was bearing down a barrel on your mother or your father. Or on your wife or on your children. You couldn't do it even if their lives depended on it. You couldn't. we're out of here then your lives are going to depend on whether you do or not then you'll see just how truth righteous you are and by then it will be too late for so many of you verse 13 in Habakkuk chapter 1 thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil and canst, canst not look on iniquity Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue, when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? Place. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. He wants all men everywhere to come to repentance. Uh, actually, before we go to that, uh, go to Romans chapter 2. Why don't you go to, to Corinthians, Brad? Go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Verses 1 under verse 4. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same. This is talking about a lost person, lost person, judging a lost person for doing the same things and they're not saved anyway. This is not talking about, because true judgment, you know, the ones that everybody is, you know, to defend the heretic, uh, uh, judge not that ye be not judged. It's talking about hypocritical judgment, okay? If I were a drunkard and to go to you and preach about being a drunkard, that would be hypocritical judgment. That's the judgment that's being condemned. And right here, the type of judgment that's being condemned you're a lost person lifting yourself up upon another lost person. Well, I don't do that when you're both lost and going to hell anyway. Okay? You see the point? Let's continue. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges, that judges them which do such things and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Yeah, lost people judging lost people and they lifting up themselves as uh, better or whatever, but you're both lost. You're going to hell. 
It's like, okay, you, okay, you might not get drunk or whatnot, or look at porn or whatever, but you're cheating on your wife. Okay? <laughs> All right? Remember, the law is there to show you that you can't do anything to save yourself. That's what the law is there for. You're under the law. The Lord save you, you are no longer under the law. Okay? Not that you are without law, you are under law of Christ. Okay? There's a difference. But the law is there to show you that you can't save yourself. Hence, people will lift up themselves by thinking, okay. And this is why people like Mark the Messenger are so dangerous. Because they preach to you uh, words to no profit. That you got to keep the law today to stay, to stay and be saved and be right with God. But no. No. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Okay? But verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Roll this around in your head. Sister, why are you in that position? I know, to make a living. I, I get that. But why are you there? Why are you there? Brother, why are you beholding that wickedness? Why? Why? We are to be examples, right? Ambassadors for Christ. You've already done your, you've already given testimony. You've already given an example. Mark chapter 6, verse 7 on to verse 11. Now, this was before the death, burial, and resurrection. Yes, it is. But, okay. We're going to look at Romans chapter 12, okay? We're going in this order purposely, okay? Mark chapter uh, 6, verses 7 on to verse 11. Before the death, burial, and resurrection. Remember that. We divide the word of truth. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no scrip, brother, thank you, <laughs> no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals, and not put on two coats. Jesus Christ was on the earth back then, physically. He, he made fishes appear in people's hands, and, and bread appear out of nothing. Okay, he can miracle, he's God, he can do that. Okay, that's why. He could, you know, miraculously, because he's God, he could take some, uh, make something out of nothing. Okay? Okay, that's the significance. But now let's keep reading. And he said unto them, What place soever ye enter into any house, uh, excuse me, in what place soever ye enter into an house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. For a testimony against now go to Romans chapter 12. I know you said, well, Brad, you said Romans chapter 12. I, I know I said that. I know what I said. I know what I said. I'm not the one who, I'm not the one who's in charge here. Okay? Romans chapter 12, verses 17 on to verse 21. For a testimony against them. Romans 12, verses 17 on to the close of the chapter. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Evil for evil. Now, so a pacifist might come to this and say, well, don't defend yourself. Go, go, 
Go put your head in the sand. Go take a long walk off of a short pier. Okay? No. This is not that. Depraved indifference is wickedness. Okay? Defend yourself. Especially if you've got a wife and uh, children. Okay? But no. Recompense no evil. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Well, he did evil to me. I'm going to do evil to him, but ten times... No! You don't fight fire with fire. Because when you fight fire with fire, fire wins regardless. So what if your earth burns just a little bit more hotter? If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. People will use this verse and twist it in order for unity. And they say, as much as lieth in you, if it be possible. And what they will use this for is a way to twist it to deny scripture. So, the Bible says that you got it possible. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And then they go to Hebrews, which is written for the Hebrews during the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, what is it? Seek uh, peace. Or seek godliness with because without there no man will see God. They'll tie that verse into this. Um, as much if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. This does not give you a go ahead green light to deny scripture in order to have peace with people. Okay? This this is a this is the standard. This is where where you want to hear the Lord speak to you? Read the scriptures out loud, okay? This is how the Lord speaks to you today, through the scriptures, okay? If you're walking along and hearing audible voices, uh, <laughs> is it possible that God could do that today? Yes, it is. But remember, God is a spirit. And if God were to actually audibly speak to you today, you would be able to back it up through scripture, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I know crazy people will go to stuff like this to try to justify, well, God appeared to me personally. No, he did not. No, he did not. You're, you're crazy. You saw a devil. Okay, that's what you saw. You did not see God. Okay? You did not see God. All right? Let's continue. Right here. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. Again, this is not talking about um, immediate self-defense. If you got some psychopath wanting to shoot you or stab you or bludgeon you to death with a baseball bat because they missed you with a car, okay? That's, that's not what it's talking about. You got someone who's doing evil to you, uh, don't fight fire with fire. Because fire will win. Yeah, your fire burned a little bit hotter than his. But fire ultimately won. They'll get what's coming to them. Okay. This is not talking about anything about depraved indifference. That you're not going to, that you're just going to stand there and be a doormat. That's not what this is talking about. It's talking about you wanting to get even. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. And shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If he, if he thirst, give him drink, desiring the sincere milk of the word. Uh-huh, yeah. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head testimony against them. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. What is good? That is what is good the scriptures. Don't overcome evil. Don't fight fire with fire. We are to be different. We are to be different. Okay? Go back to Job chapter 9. 
go back to Job chapter 9. And let's continue from verse 25 on. Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away. They see no good. They are passed away as the swift ships, as the eagle that hasted to the prey. If I say, I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my heaviness and comfort myself. I am afraid of all my sorrows. I know that thou wilt not hold me innocent. If I be wicked, why then labor I in vain? If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch, mine own clothes shall abhor me. And, and when doing this, right away what came to mind was this, in Jude, of course, Jude, mine own clothes shall abhor me. Extreme hatred, that's what it means to abhor. And right away, Jude came to mind. Jude, verses 17 on to verse 23. But beloved, remember, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. Oh, I'm, I'm one of the chosen ones. I'm elect. And you're not elect. Separate themselves. Sensual, led by their senses. Having not the spirit. If you're being led by your senses... <laughs> Odds are, the Holy Ghost is not in you and the Lord is that Spirit. Odds are. Again, using Mark the Messenger as an example. He separates himself. He, he is one of those, as you call, a uh, black Hebrew Israelite. And he's, uh, he calls, it, if you're chosen, uh, veiled Calvinism. Elect and non-elect. Okay? These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. Or, if you want, British Israelitism. Okay? That you're in England in one of the ten tribes or something, of the law, of the whatever. Come on, man. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The redemption of the purchased possession. The mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ himself, the blessed hope. Christ himself. We're looking, listening for him. Okay? And of some have compassion making a difference testimony against them some and of some have uh, and of some have compassion making a difference and others safe with fear pulling them out of the fire hating even the garments spotted by the flesh hmm. hating even the garment spotted by sinful flesh thought that was an interesting little tie-in right there. Go back to Job chapter 9. Okay? Job chapter 9. Let's pick up at verse 32 and verse 33. These especially. And hence, dispensationally, you got to rightly divide the word of truth. We're looking at this for our instruction in righteousness. But look at this right here. Yet shalt thou plunge me into... Let's read verse 31 again. Yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch. Mine own clothes shall abhor me. For he is not a man as I am. That I should answer him. And we should come together in judgment. Ooh. He is not a man as I am. But what saith the scripture? Go to First Timothy. Well, let's read verse 33. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay, hand, lay his hand upon us both. Hmm. 
what's that the scripture though? Go to uh, hold your place here again. Go to First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two. Again, you Calvinists, you wicked Calvinists. First uh, Timothy chapter two, verses three on to verse six. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of, of the truth. God wants all men to be saved. If you women are encompassed with men because you came out of man, whether you like to accept that or not. Okay? For there is one God who is comprised of spirits all body. Okay. Not three gods, okay? For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, not the woman, Mary, okay? Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Hmm. Interesting. But see, it says here, back in Job, that Okay, we just read that. The man, Christ Jesus. But here Job says, For he is not a man as I am. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Flesh is sinful. But God within flesh could not sin. But all the temptation of sin was aimed at the flesh. That's, you know, or else how do you reconcile uh, God cannot be tempted with evil? But yet, Jesus sure was tempted with evil, wasn't he? Satan's temptation. That was, he was tempting, apparently tempting God, right? But God cannot be tempted with evil, can he? So how do you reconcile that? Hmm? How do you reconcile that? this that's sinful the word that was made flesh that flesh was sinful okay Christ never sinned okay Jesus Jehovah saves the anointed one he never sinned he never sinned even though the flesh was more than capable of sinning and the temptation that Satan aimed at Christ was of the flesh Again, else how do you reconcile God shall not be tempted with evil? But yet he was tempted with evil by Satan in the wilderness. How do you reconcile that? Uh -huh. So when he says he is not a man as I am, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. We just saw it. Verse 5 in 2 Timothy chapter, uh, yeah, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, excuse me. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He was of purer eyes to behold evil, but yet he saw evil. How do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile that? Job sinned. You and I sinned. You and I sin. Why? Because the flesh, the flesh lusteth against the spirit. And unlike God who is perfect, we cannot go sinless in this life. So when Job says he is not a man as I am, meaning sinful, Jesus never sinned. His flesh, the word made flesh, okay, genius, okay. The flesh was more than capable of sinning. And if you read Romans chapter 8, this is 1 under verse 4, I know a lot of you who are brilliant but yet can't read English, um, declared sin, the flesh is sinful. Uh, our Lord himself says, uh, the words I speak unto the flesh profiteth nothing. Okay? Okay? That's what that means. When Job says, 
Yet, uh, for he is not a man as I am. He's not a man as I am. Sinful. Okay? That I should answer him. And we should come to come together in judgment. Okay? Even though God was a man, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Okay? We're not on his same level. He never sinned. We sin all the time. Okay? Verse 32. Or verse 33. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might, might lay ha his hand upon us both. Hence, Jesus Christ. Okay? Okay? And let, let's finish this up. Let him take his rod away from me. And let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak and not fear him. But it is not so with me. This Job feared the Lord. Oh, Job definitely feared the Lord. As do we, as the church of the living God. You know, the God that these people who do works to save themselves, the God they fear is the one usually they're looking at in the mirror. Their father, Satan. They fear man. They make man an idol. Like this morning, I answered a comment of someone who was like, well, what does the authorized version say of Matthew 5, 44? Dude, you're not rightly dividing the word of truth. <laughs> you, you didn't even watch the video. Okay, shut up. <laughs> Made an idol out of a man, boy. That's what most people do. Now, now go to Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. Most people make an idol out of themselves, out of a man, out of a system. Okay. Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. We want verses one, on the verse ten. But there were false prophets among, also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Got to be careful there, brethren, that the Lord, uh, if you're uh, going after sin in your life, you got to be careful that the Lord doesn't hand you over to that sin so that you will be destroyed. Got to be careful with that. Okay? very careful. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Steve Anderson. The way of truth which he doesn't preach, but he calls himself a King James Bible believing Christian. Okay? And the whole new IFB crowd. Okay? Okay? <laughs> And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person of the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered. Just Lot vexed it with the filthy conversation of the wicked. I know you're vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. So am I. So am I. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed it his righteous soul from day to day, day to day with their unlawful deeds. The thing about Lot is you got to remember, Scripture declares Lot righteous. But you got to remember, 
lot messed up pretty bad. How so? The men of Sodom who wanted to come and rape angels. Instead of that, he's like, here, take my daughters instead. Praise the Lord, the uh, angels are like, dude, no, no, that's no. Okay? He was supposed to get out of there quick, fast, like in a hurry, but he lingered. Okay? He lingered. Took a little, took a little too much time. To the point where the angels are like, okay, come on, get out of here, because we can't destroy this place until you get out. Okay, a type of the redemption of the purchase possession, by the way. And while he was delivered from that, he debated, oh, let me not go here, but let me go to here. It's like, okay, fine. You don't want to go to this place, you can go to Zoar. Okay, fine. Just go. Just go. Okay? He got drunk. He got drunk. The scriptures talks about how his daughters... The same daughters whom he wanted to give unto the men to rape instead of angels. He got drunk and his daughters were with child by their father. And of course from that came the Moabites and the Ammonites. Yeah, and look what trouble the Moabites and the Ammonites have caused to Israel. Okay? Lot was far from perfect. Far from. He messed up. He messed up big. And look how what it cost a lot. His offspring, his lineage is of Moab and the Ammonites. But the scripture right here says, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed it his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. That's you and I today. We're vexed it with this. And whether we die or redeem, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the ungodly. Excuse me. <laughs> the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Hold your place there. You, you ought to know where we're going. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Temptation. There's no temptation taken uh, you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but, with, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. People will come to verse 13 here and use this to say, well, God will not give you more than you can handle. No, sir. God will give you everything that you can't handle. Why? <coughs> so that you are Christ dependent and not self-sufficient. They will come to this and say, God won't give me more than I can handle. That's not true. God will give you a lot more than you can handle. That you depend on Him, not yourself. This is talking about temptation. Okay? Temptation. And you know what? Now go back to Second Peter. Okay, let's read verse nine again. The Lord knoweth how to to deliver the godly out of temptation. He provides a way of escape, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Like I've told you before, look for that way of escape. It is not the way of the world. It is not the way of the devil. Don't go to the devil for comfort. Don't go to the devil for comfort. Don't go to the devil for truth. Don't. And you know what? When you look at it, when you, in retrospect, look at that sin, you know, it's like, Lord, please forgive me. I repent. I'm sorry that I did that. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. If you look back at it and truly look at it, 
There was a way of, of escape there for you to bear that temptation. Every, without exception. Without exception. For every temptation that you have. If that ain't true, then, then God's a liar. With every single temptation, that temptation to get even, that temptation to light up that cigarette or that joint, that temptation to drink that booze, that temptation to write that stupid comment, that temptation to go to that website that you shouldn't go to, to that temptation to look on the back side of that fine looking woman or look at the front side of that handsome man there, women. With every temptation you need that, every temptation, there's a way to escape. Now, if you're lost, that doesn't apply to you, obviously. Because, I, I close the scripture, because uh, you got to look at the, at the verse in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And, and there again, the thing about the, the flesh thing, okay? How do you reconcile Jesus Christ being tempted of the devil if God cannot be tempted with evil. How do you reconcile that, genius? Never mind. Let's continue. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. God is faithful. Do not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. That's in context to someone who is saved. If you ain't saved, this, this means nothing to you. You might as well, if you're lost, you might as well do what Oscar Wilde said. If you don't know who he is, great. If you do, sorry. Okay? What did he say? The best way to get rid of a temptation is to give into it. Yeah, that's brilliant. And uh, light your cigarette going all the way down to hell, boy. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Bear it. Note that bear it. To endure. Long suffer bear it. Because, you know, you're sitting there amongst lost peace people, not by choice. Your family are all Catholic and lost. Honoring the scriptures. Honoring the scriptures. By um, loving your father, uh, honoring thy father and thy mother. Your entire family has turned against you. With the temptation, you will make a way of escape. And you may be able to bear it. Don't forget that. If that ain't true, then, then why are we even doing what we're doing right now? Let's continue in Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the, lusts, in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. That's self-governance, by the way. Okay? Self-governance. Presumptuous, presumptuous are they. Self-will. See, self-will is to tie into what despise government. Okay? Because people will come to this and it's like, well, we're not to, to despise our American Jesuit-run controlled and operated government. We're not to despise our government. It's run by the Jesuit order. This is talking about what? Those who are self-willed. Self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Mm -hmm. Self-willed. Well, isn't self-government a thing of self will we're told to mortify our flesh. Okay? We are told to mortify, put down, to kill the things of the flesh. That's not a suggestion, by the way. Because if you don't, what happens? You might as well live by the standard of Oscar Wilde. Hey, you got a temptation? Get rid of it. Give into it. 
Okay? Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might. Oh, wait. We were supposed to read to only chapter, uh, verse 10, weren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Let's read to verse 12. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these as natural brute beasts, they to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. <laughs> utterly perish in their own corruption. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. Those lost people that you are around. A lot of you don't have that choice, whether it's your career or that you're taking care of a loved one or that you're at home and you can't go anywhere. Remember, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the, God, the godly out of temptations. He makes a way to escape, makes a way of escape, and ye may be able to bear it. Now go to Psalm 66. Psalm 66. Psalm 66. One second, right? Psalm 66. We want verses 16 on to verse 20. And we're going to have a little expository here as well. Come in here, all ye that fear God. And I will declare what he hath done for my soul. All ye that fear God. Some people will call this boasting. And I will declare what he hath done for my soul. How God has saved my soul. How the Lord is glorified through a circumstance. That's not boasting, dear friend. That's glorifying the Lord. There's a difference. Okay? In verse 17, I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. Hold your place here and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 on to verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 on to verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, not 1 Corinthians, Brad. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Verses 3 on to verse 6. Yes. Verses 16 and 17 again in Psalm 66. Come and hear, all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 on to verse 6. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Who comforteth us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Verse 16 and 17 again in Psalm 66. Come and hear, all ye that fear God, I will declare what. I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. So, put this in the equation. What if you're going through something right now that somewhere in the mix there of the time that the Lord has allotted you, someone's going to come into your life who's going to be going through something very similar, and that you, as the Church of the Living God, with that brother or sister, you may be able to comfort someone who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. My best friend is going through a situation that very similarly I went through several years ago. Very similar. Very similar. I went through a lot of the same stuff that he's going through right now. Hence, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort 
wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. That's why I say, brethren, talk to one another. Speak, converse with one another. Pray with one another. Pray for one another. Okay? Because maybe there's something that's in you that you have gone through can be a supply for a brother or sister's want who's going through something exactly the same or at least similar to what you've been through. And you, as a brother or sister, can be in that situation as a source of comfort to these people. To our brethren of the Church of the Living God. Because how many of us are going through stuff right now? Everybody that I know of and talk to are going through something. Unless, you know, you're one of the chosen ones and, and you know, <laughs> yeah. For as the suffering, verse 5, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Christ, who is our source of all hope, our Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed hope, the resurrection and the life, the God of all comfort. The Comforter, the Holy Ghost, and the Lord is that Spirit. Okay? And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Hey, I've been there before, brother. Sister, I've been there. Let's... Let's go through some scriptures together. Let me share with some of you with you some of the scriptures that the Lord shared with me when I was going through that same thing. But you know what else too, brethren, that I've learned? Sometimes, sometimes and actually more often than not. You might have gone through something that a brother or sister is going, going through right now. And, and you want to praise the Lord. You want to be there with all these. It's like, hey, you know, like I just said, let me comfort you with how the Lord comforted me. Amen. But sometimes the best thing you can do is shut up and let them speak. Let them vent. Let them share their, grievous, uh, their, their grievance. Let them share their sorrows. It, it, is, it is an art form, to be honest with you, to listen. Because remember the example of Job's friends. Job, who was going through something that well, he lost his, his family, his livelihood, he lost everything in one, two, three, four, and one fell swoop. He even had his wife nagging him. Curse God, you know, still you maintain your integrity. Curse God and die. Okay? And what, what Job went through. His friends started out great. They didn't say anything. They just kept their mouth shut. Because his grief was very great. But what happened? They opened their mouths. They spake truth in the premise of something that wasn't true, accusing Job of wrongdoing. When if you read the book of Job again, Job did nothing to warrant at the first Satan's temptation, but or Satan's attack on him. Okay, but later on in the book of Job, as we already talked about, Job through the constant um, barrage from his friends started lifting up himself. Most of the times, dear brethren, in a time of comfort, wait. You might have some burning that you need to, that you feel the need that you got to say, wait for them to finish. Wait for them to speak. Wait for them. Because if you are going to be a comfort on any brother or sister, yes, you comfort through scripture, but you got to remember too, they're just a safe sinner like you are. And 
they need to vent as well. Remember that. Okay? Remember that, please. Please. Now go back to Psalm 66. Let's reread verses 16 and 17 again. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. Verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Oh, if you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. And you know what came to mind immediately with that? You know what came to mind immediately with that? The first thing, Jonah. Jonah, you don't go to the devil for comfort. You don't go to the devil for comfort. Jonah, come on. Come on, fingers, work with me. Jonah. Come on. Come on, yes, my dairy. Jonah chapter 2, one verse. Verse 8. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. God's not mad at you. God loves you. Hey, does, hey your sin isn't gonna, gonna cost you your salvation. It's gonna cost you everything else, but it's not gonna cost you your salvation, so go ahead. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Forget about it, right? Uh, Psalm 15. Psalm 15 in its entirety. Psalm 15. Can you handle Psalm 15 in its entirety? Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Him that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. you got to remember, rightly dividing the word of truth, this was written in a time when it was faith and works. Okay? Faith and works under the law. So, walking in, walking uprightly according to the law. Okay? In order to be right with God. This is our instruction in righteousness. Okay? You can be saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God and not be doing anything according to scripture. Your life is going to be a mess. You're going to be a train wreck of a man or a woman. You're not going to be a good witness unto God. You're going to be shaming God with every breath. You'll go to heaven. But you're going to drag the Lord's name and his word through the mud by your abhorrent example unto the lost. And beware of those who say that that doesn't mean anything. Okay? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. And also too, Psalm 84. If I if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Those who regard all lying vanities forsake their own mercy. You you decide to be an idiot, void of logic and reason, and live like a fool who say in your heart there is no God, and you're actually saved. Oh. Lord's going to be ashamed of you for eternity. And you're okay with that. I have doubts about you. Psalm 84, verses 8 on to verse 12. O Lord, o, o Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Shilam. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Amen. Amen. 
For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. How does this differ for today? How does this differ for today? 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. Well, let's go back to Psalm uh, 66. And now let's read verses 19 on to verse 20. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy. Go to 1 Timothy. Uh, where, where are we at? Uh, uh, where, where are we at? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. S sorry about that. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now this is different. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We want verses 11 on to verse 16. It is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Dead to the world, we will also live with him. He who saves his life shall lose it. But he who loses his life for my sake, the Lord's, the same shall find it. Dead to the world. Okay? If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now see, heretics will say, see, if we deny him, he'll deny us, meaning salvation. That's not talking about salvation. No good, he will withhold no good thing from those who walk uprightly. Today in this dispensation, you come to the Lord on his terms, you are saved, born again, sealed. Okay, sealed until the day of redemption. Once saved, always saved. That's why heretics like Mark the Messenger, they don't believe in eternal security. They're not saved. They're saving themselves. Okay? They're saving themselves. They come to this, who don't rightly divide the word of truth, they come to this, it's like, so see if we deny him, we're not saved. He, it says we, he, he denies us. This isn't talking about salvation. It's talking about blessings, mercies, kindness, provision. Okay? That's what it's talking about. Not our salvation. Why? Okay? Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Okay? I know a lot of you are so, uh, struggling. But you got to remember, if you are truly saved, what's going to separate you from the love of Christ? Hmm? Not even your sin is going to do that. If it gets bad enough, the Lord will kill you. And yeah, He'll be ashamed of you. But it, it will be a mercy to prevent you from sinning if you will not give it up. But uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and verse 6. Blessed be the Lord God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinating, predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, the Calvinist who preaches elect and non-elect, like that heretic Mark the Messenger, if you're one of the chosen ones, fine. If not, well, whatever. That's veiled Calvinism. Okay, This is not elect and non-elect. That's heresy. Okay, What is this talking about? Video for that will be in the description box. Uh, if you're not going to watch it, shut up! Okay? Shut up if you're not going to watch it. Alright? But what is this talking about? Okay? According as he hath chosen us in him. In him. Okay? We go to Christ. His way. Not yours. You don't boot the door out of the way, friend. And shout to the crap. No. You go his way, not yours. You go his way, broken of your self-righteousness, godly sorrow, contrition, it's your fault that he died. And in fear of him you call upon his name, may he save you. That is the way of the cross. And if you go to him 
on his terms, not your own, according as he hath chosen us in him. You've gone to him, excuse me, according to his way, not your own. And when you come to him on his terms, not your own, having predestinated us, you are going to heaven whether you like it or not. Okay? Once you come to the Lord on his terms, his way, you are part of the elect. Okay? For this dispensation. Elect for this dispensation is to the Jew first and also, also to the Gentile. Okay? Okay? So when you see Paul especially talking about the elect, it's defined by context. Usually when it says the elect, it's about the Jews. But here, talking about us being the elect. Okay? Talking about how we were grafted in. We are elect because we go the way of the cross. It's not the satanic heresy of Calvinism. Not at all. Video in the description box talking about that. Okay? Having predestinated in us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. What is the beloved? Israel, the apple of his eye. We were grafted in. And see, since we come to the Lord on his terms, verses 13 and 14, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, after whom, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Sealed until the day of redemption. Sealed. Once saved, always saved. Okay? And since we are once saved, always saved, Ephesians 4, verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. You cannot become unsealed. Okay? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30, And because we are sealed, once saved, always saved, the Lord lives within us. Ephesians 5, Verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Okay, what does that mean? We're once saved, always saved. So when you go, now go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Okay, now, if we just saw sealed until the day of redemption, okay, and predestinated to go to be with the Lord, we went to him on his terms. Once saved, always saved. How do you reconcile this? If we deny him, he also will deny us. If you are one of these uh, non-dispensational heretics, how do you reconcile this? You can't. You have to hold to the, well then, it's about salvation. It's not about salvation. If you deny what the Lord says about how to live rightly according to Scripture for us today in this dispensation. Remember, the way we serve the Lord reflects Him in the eyes of the lost unto whom we are called to be an example unto. And in that time of your temptation, brother, oh, the Lord knows how to. Oh, doesn't He? Oh, doesn't He? Your family is lost in all Catholic. Hope Satan's going to use that to attack you. To try to light that fire so that you fight fire with fire, doesn't it? You gotta, you're sitting there honoring thy father and thy mother and yet being subjected to poison. And you know it. And the devil. <laughs> Still retain your integrity? Curse God and die, right? 
deny him, he will deny us. Not salvation. Give in a little. Don't, don't hold to such a high standard. The way to get unity with lost people is to deny this. Don't deny the scriptures. Don't deny the scriptures. Way too many a Christian does that. It's not worth it. Let's continue. In uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, picking up at verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. As we already expounded on, he cannot deny himself. Why? Because we are part, we are members of his body, of his bones, and of his flesh. He cannot deny himself. Why? The Lord lives within us. We are sealed until the day of redemption. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers, which a dear man accused me of doing. Words to no profit. You gotta be keep the Ten Commandments today to be saved. Once saved, always saved is an heresy. Those are words to no profit. Those are words to no profit. It doesn't profit you to try to keep the law for salvation. It doesn't work like that. And when someone comes around telling you that you gotta keep the commandments, you gotta keep the commandments. Once saved, always saved, never sat right with me. Well, you're not saved to begin with. <laughs> Study to shew thyself approved unto God. And those of you uh, poor people who defend that wicked Mark the Mess, in that video, that's all Mark the Messenger would say. Study to shew thyself approved unto God. He wouldn't quote the rest of the verse. Because he would have to explain what it means and he doesn't do it himself. Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And is it not obvious that that has already happened? Go to Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64. Isaiah chapter 64, verses 7 on to verse 9. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. See, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, never sinned. But because of the flesh, he knows what it's like to endure the temptations of the flesh. Even though he himself God cannot be tempted with evil. Again, how do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile that? The temptation was all in the flesh. God knows what we go through. God understands what we go through. And with all the temptations that you and I uh, receive every day, there's always a way of escape. Don't forget that. Please don't forget that. Please don't forget that. Don't go to the devil for comfort. Please don't forget that there's always a way to escape. Always. Unfortunately, most of us won't recognize it until after the fact that there's always a way of escape. And you got to remember Isaiah chapter 53. He has a kindred spirit with our spirit. 
He knows what we're going through. He understands. Why? Because God was man. But yet, not like you and I, like Job said, he is not a man as I am. He, he, Jesus Christ, he was a man. Absolutely. But not like you and me. We sin. He never did. And so many people bring God, try to bring God down to their level. Well, God was in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Yes. But he never sinned. But like Lot, he was vexed at every day. He could read minds. He knew what people were thinking. And he was of pure eyes. <laughs> you think, well, you don't think God knows what you're going through, huh? He sure does. He sure does. He sure does. Now go to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. Verses 19 on to verse 25. Woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous. But I said, truly this is a grief and I must bear it. God is a God of justice. God is a God of judgment. God does not afflict willingly. He would much, he delighteth in mercy. God would much more rather be merciful unto you. But if you're going to screw around and play with God, mess around with your calling, say, I'm, I'm saved, I'm justified to do whatever, God's grace cover, covers it all. God is a God of justice. God is a God of judgment. Okay? He's the one who repays. You walk contrary to him, even today, you might not pay for it now, but you're going to pay for it sooner or later. God is a God of judgment. Okay. He would much rather be merciful, yes. But if you play with him, oh, he's going to play with you. He's going to play with you. My tabernacle is spoiled. And all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me, and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains. For the pastors, like today, brethren, for the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the brutes has come and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Because we don't know what is good. We know what is good because we have the scriptures. Yes, we do. God knows what is good. But you left to yourself, you have no idea what is good and what is evil. Because of the fall, we are able to judge good and evil. Yes! But we don't know truly what is good and truly what is evil. And today, so many people are saying that good is evil and evil is good. You say you're a good person, you don't even know your own heart. Oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment. Not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob, and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. Correct me, yes, with judgment, not in anger. And if you are saved, born again, converted, <laughs> if God is angry enough with you, you're playing around with sin, He'll hand you over to that sin to you so that you will die from it. Be careful. God is a God of judgment. God is a God of judgment. Is what's going on in your life a result of you messing around? I, I gotta ask the question. 
You got to ask the question. Now go to Hebrews about that. Hebrews chapter 12. About chasing. The difference maker. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. There are those of us who are going through things because we have made our stand. Here we stand, we will not be moved. We're not going to um, we're not going to circumvent the scriptures in, in order to get along with our families. We're not going to um, cast away scripture to have unity. We're not going to not deny what God said in order to get along. Then again, there are those out there who are, are suffering right now because they decided to circumvent scripture are putting those wicked things before their eyes. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 on to verse 13. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And of course, that's Proverbs 3, verse 12. Look that up on your own time. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. If you have done something that you know is outright sin, and it's been some time, or if not immediate, and there's no chastening there, you know, you're a Christian, and you put on this facade, you say you are because you, you think you are because you say you are, right? And you do something that even you know, wow, that was pretty good sin. Right? Pretty good sin, right? Yeah. But nothing's happening. I'm not being chastened. Actually, good worldly blessings are coming to me because of it. Huh. Which Christ are you looking towards? Furthermore, we had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence shall we not much rather be in subjection under the father capital F of spirits and live for they verily for a few days chastened us after our after their own pleasure but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. That's verse, thir uh, verse 13. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Because broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, right? Isn't it interesting when you're being tempted that it seems like the devil just, well, here, 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 here. When the way of our Lord is simple, get down on your knees and put your nose in the carpet. <laughs> get into your bedroom or somewhere. Get away. Get, your, get away. Go, go sit in the car. Go sit in the car. Go into your bedroom. Lock the door. Shut the door. Separate from that. Get away from the temptation. With every temptation, there's a way of escape, brother and sister. Every temptation. Without exception. Do you see that way of escape? Maybe it might not be the way you, the way of escape you're looking for, right? Now, now let's go to Luke chapter twelve. Here, here's another thing that um, happens, and this is something that I fall fall for because the thing, worldly things, worldly provisions, you can get sidetracked. You can get sidetracked with these kinds of. And we need not so. Luke chapter 12, verses 22 on to verse 
34 is what we want. Luke chapter 12, verses 22 on to verse 34. Now this is before the death, burial, and resurrection. And we're going to look at the tie-in for us today. Okay? The context of what we are looking for, which is before the death, burial, and resurrection, is in the context that the king was physically on the earth. Okay? That's the context. That's what this, that's the premise. The, the king, our Lord Jesus Christ, was physically right there. This is before the death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? Okay? You have to remember that. We're looking at this for our instruction and in righteousness. But, we're going to see in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going back there, Christ dependence rather than self-sufficiency. Okay? Luke chapter 12, verses 22 on to verse 34. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. Life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Again, context, premise, the King, God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who made bread out of nothing and fishes, uh, multiplying in droves for 5,000 people, okay? He could miraculously provide, okay? That's the premise, okay? The context. That's why he is saying this, okay? Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, which taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit. Like my wife has said to me, it's like, you know, Brad, with as much as you get worried sometimes, you ought to be 10 foot tall and playing in the NBA. Okay? <laughs> All right? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? O ye of little faith. That's the one. And in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, faith is only mentioned one time, you guys. And right there in the form of a rebuke, like it is here in Luke chapter 12, the same as it is in Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount. Because the Sermon on the Mount is all works. Okay? And people will go to this and say, well, we're not supposed to, we shouldn't work today because God will provide for us. Yes, He will provide for us by you working. Whatever it is the Lord has called you to do. Okay? The Lord has called me to do this. This is what I do. This is what he has called me to do. Okay? Whatever the Lord has called you to do, that is what he has called you to do. And he will provide for you through that. Okay? But see, you got to remember, Jesus Christ is not physically on the earth. His body is, but he himself is not. Okay? He himself physically is not. When he is, he's going to be ruling in Jerusalem. Okay? But he is not. See, that's rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? Remember, in Luke here, he says, uh, But now, grab a sword. Because he was going to the cross. This dispensation, the dispensation of the law, which this was written under, before the death, burial, and res resurrection. The New Testament begins with the death of the testator. You read that in Hebrews chapter 9. It didn't begin with the birth. While on the earth before the death burial and resurrection uh, he was still under the law okay but okay but this is being said in that context that the king was on the earth but look at this verse 29 and seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink neither be ye doubt of doubtful mind of doubtful mind for all these things do the nations of the world seek after and your father knoweth that ye have need of all the, of these things. Verse 31. 
but rather seek ye the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added unto you. And you read this in the Sermon on the Mount, that distinction is clear also. Because in Matthew, kingdom of heaven is prevalent. And in the book of Matthew is where you only see the kingdom of heaven mentioned. Kingdom of heaven. Okay? On the Sermon on the Mount, where this is up. Let, let's go there. Let's go there. Let's, let's see that. Let's see that. Okay? Let's see that. One second. Yes. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. See, in the Sermon on the Mount where he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, he makes that distinction about the kingdom of God there. That's not to be missed. Because the kingdom of God is talking about the spiritual. Okay, the spiritual kingdom. Yes, kingdom of God can be a reference onto the kingdom of heaven. But that's defined by the context. Usually, it's the spiritual. While kingdom of heaven is always, always the physical literal kingdom. Okay, always, always. Okay, and back here in uh, Luke chapter 12, because we are reading on to verse 34, verse 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourself bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not. Where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupt. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your treasure is. And how many people have their treasures here on earth? Whether it's land, property, whether it's whatever it is, your possessions. This is not it. We are to be eternally minded. And is that easy to do? No, it's not. But we are reminded to be eternally minded. Because we're not going to take this stuff with us. Every one of us is going to give an account of himself to God. Whether at the great white throne for lost people or for those who are redeemed at the judgment seat of Christ. Yes. Where is your heart? Where is your treasure? See, Satan will tempt you to get your eyes focused on this stuff. And we're supposed to be having our attention on things that pertain unto heaven. And like it says here in verse 31, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 7. Verses 7 on to verse 11. Verses 7 on to verse 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1. See how we did that? And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Christ dependent, not self sufficient. Christ dependent, not self sufficient. Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver. In whom we trust that he will do yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us. That for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons. Thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Christ dependent over self-sufficiency. And see, Satan comes in with that temptation for self-sufficiency. I don't want to hear this, so I'm going to take the measure to do it. What if God has put you in that situation to be a testimony against them? Because, hey, think about it, brother, sister. Though that lost family that you're forced to live with, 
at the great white throne, my servant lived amongst you and lived as a testimony against you. He stood for my word and you mocked him. I want to be in their shoes. Or those people that you work around, my servant was around you all the time. And by her example, she was a testimony against you. And you didn't even inquire of this Jesus whom she serves. Who wouldn't want to be those people? Or the testimony unto the, unto the one who brought you into this world. Who at the great white throne is going to have to say, My servant, your son, live this an example of me, and you didn't hear it. Yeah, that hurts. That hurts. I know, brother. I know. But that's we are living we are a living testimony. And in some situations we are that testimony against them. And when they stand at the great white throne, my servant was among you. You didn't do anything with it. See, there's purpose in it. There's always a purpose in it. Always, always, always a purpose in it. Always a purpose. Go now to Proverbs chapter 8. We're almost done. Go to Proverbs chapter 8. We're almost done, people. Sorry, like I said, um, my mother at the great white throne, the Lord's going to say to her, my servant, your son, testified of the gospel, testified of me, gave you witness and testimony of me, you wouldn't believe it and you wouldn't receive it. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8 verses 22 on to the close of the chapter. Today's the 8th. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. The very first verse in Proverbs 8 is, Doth not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? And wisdom equated to the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is comparable unto, a, the, unto the beauty of a woman. Okay? The fear of the Lord is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Okay? To have the fear of the Lord is, like I said, is comparable. You read the proverb for today. It's comparable because you'll see this. Doth not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? Verse 2. She standeth in the high places by the way in the path, places of the paths. Okay? Fear of the Lord and departing from evil, wisdom and understanding is so beautiful in the sight of the Lord that he is giving us the example of a beautiful woman. Okay? A beautiful woman. That's what it's comparable unto. And right here, uh, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. What is this talking about? Who is this talking about? It's not talking about Mary. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting from the beginning, or ever the earth was. What is this talking about? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. 
In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Verse 3, And God said, spake, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Who is this talking about? Okay. Uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Who is this talking about? Okay. The fear of the Lord, again, is comparable, is uh, compared to a beautiful woman. Beautiful. Fear of the Lord is a good thing. It's comparable unto a beautiful woman. Again. Okay. Same with understanding. But here in verse 22 and 23. In Proverbs 8, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of His way, before His works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, wherever the earth was. Uh, John chapter 1, verses 1, on to verse 5. In the beginning was the capital W, Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, where was the Word? In the beginning, the capital W, Word. Verse 3 in Genesis chapter 1. And God said, God said. God said. Okay? The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. God said, let there be light. And it was so. Okay? That's, that's pretty easy to figure out. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not, was not anything made that was made. Hence, Jesus is the Creator. Okay? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Okay? And let's look at verse 14. <laughs> and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the Word was made flesh. The Word. That's verse 3 in Genesis chapter 1. God said. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Okay? Okay? So, go back to Proverbs chapter 8 now. Okay? Uh, you know what? One more, one more stop on this. Uh, Psalm 2. Okay? Psalm 2. Psalm 2, not Job. Psalm 2, we want verses 10 on to verse 12. In Psalm 2. Be wise now therefore. Wisdom. Ooh, wise, having wisdom. Fear of the Lord. O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Again, Proverbs 8 is glorifying the wisdom of God, which is the fear of the Lord. Uh, uh, and up here, uh, in verse 12, I wisdom dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty invention. Job 28, 28. We already mentioned it. Okay, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. Everything that Satan offers you and your temptations. Now let's continue. Uh, verse 23. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, wherever the earth was. Where there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Third verse in Genesis chapter 1. The Godhead in action. Spirit that moved across the waters. God, the, the Father, the soul of the Godhead. And the Word made flesh. Okay? The Word made flesh, the body. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. Okay? 
I know that's hard for you to, some of you to understand. But, okay, where there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of man. And you read in Genesis uh, that the voice of the Lord walked in the garden. How does God? How does God walk? How does the, how does the voice walk? If it doesn't have body. Okay. Yes. Yes, rejoicing in the habitable part of the earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. Verse 31. He wanted, see, we were originally created to have pristine fellowship with the Lord, where the Lord can walk amongst his creation. You know, be amongst his creatures that he created. Pristine. Okay? Man messed that up because they listened to Satan. But in the final and seventh dispensation, eternity, God is going to be amongst us once again. And what God intended for the beginning will be fulfilled in the end. Now therefore, hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction, and be wise, and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. And here is verse 36, which is posted on our front door. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me. Go to Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2. Come uh, putting this together with the Lord. Uh, was it, I have been in Habakkuk. Brethren, sisters, Church of the Living God. Hey, I, we're struggling. We're going through some stuff right now. So are you. So are you. Habakkuk chapter 2. Remember, all things that were written before time were written for our learning. Verses 1 on the verse 4. I will stand upon my watch. I will set upon I will set me upon the tower. I will watch to see what he will say unto me. And what shall I answer when I am reproved? The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Surely there will be an end. Surely there will be an end, dear friend. Behold. His soul which is lifted up in him. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. The soul which is lifted up. Oh, I, I, I did. I'm confirmed. I am keeping the commandments. I've done this. Lifted up. But the just shall live by his faith. But the just shall live by his faith. See, these people that come around preaching to you works. Their soul is lifted up in them and they're not upright. 
But we are saved by His grace through our faith. Our faith is the answer to God's grace. Nothing of ourselves. When you works heretics out there, it's all about you. It's not about us. And finally, finally, 1 Thessalonians, the proper place to end a video on this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 on to verse 18. But as touching brotherly love, and who is my brother? You are because you say you are? I don't think so. Uh, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. And that's something recently I was given a gift. I, I got a new fancy schmancy cell phone. Okay. Uh, I did. That was given to me as a gift. A birthday gift. And um, I have been negligent in communicating with the brethren. And there's, there's no excuse. That's going to be rectified. That's going to be rectified. Because, and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren, those who are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, which are in all Macedonia. Because we all we got, brethren, down here. We all got the same Father. But we are to desire to be with one another. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Why? That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without. That ye may have lack of nothing. Being an example unto them. Okay? And I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That ye saw them not. even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Or for comfort one another with these words. And that hasn't happened yet. But see, we have hope. What does that verse say right here? Verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The blessed hope is Jesus Christ. The redemption of the purchased possession is Jesus Christ. He is our hope. No matter what we are going, no matter what we are going through, we're going through some hard times right now ourselves. Jesus Christ is our hope. And please don't forget, with every it, there's no exceptions to this, with every temptation that you will encounter, Scripture tells us that He make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it every single time without exception or else this isn't true and you know I believe this is 110% true 
that's going to be it for this video. I know that a lot of you are struggling right now, as we are struggling. We're struggling right now, too. We're struggling right now, too. We don't know if we're going to make it. We really don't. But see, Satan wants us to focus on this stuff. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all this stuff will be added to you. Are you in sin? Is that why things are going uh, astray for you? You better get that cleaned up, man. Woman. Trust on the Lord. Seek Him. Whatever your situation is, there's always a way to escape. You might not think so. But my copy of the scripture says that there is. What about yours? What about yours? I hope, I pray that this video might be a source of comfort onto some of you. If you're not saved, this ain't going to comfort you. Because if you're not saved, you're saving your own self. So, that is going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for your prayers. Pray ye one another for each other. Talk to one another, brethren. And thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for the help. We need the prayers. We need all your prayers. Please pray for us. We're going through some tough times. As is many of you. Please keep in your prayers. My best friend, Brother Alexander. We need your prayers. Please pray for my brother, our brother from North Dakota. He needs your prayers. Please pray for our brother from New Jersey. Oh, he needs our prayers. Our brother from Croatia. He needs our prayers. I, our brother from Iowa or Idaho. I'm sorry I get that one confused. <laughs> our brother from Norway. Our sister from England. Oh, our brother from Oregon. Pray for one another. Pray for one another. So, anyway, that's it. Going to get this uploaded. I love you. Thank you for watching this. If you do, I hope this is uh, some sort of comfort for you. Lord willing, we'll see you in the next video.